Awesome. Uh, welcome everybody to the second video in our six part series where the ASI national team, we're just getting together um, live and chatting through uh, the snowboard tech fundamentals. And uh, I'm Brian Donovan with the ASI snowboard team. I'm going to let the team uh, introduce themselves, go around the horn, and then we're going to kind of kick it off tonight. How's it going, everybody? Chuck Hewitt here from Vale Beaver Creek. Um, getting ready to chat some fundamentals this evening. Hey, everybody. Matt Larson up in Big Sky, Montana. Eric Rolls, Park City, Utah. Hey, everyone. Stephanie Wilkerson from Mammoth Lakes, California. Hey, everyone. I'm Lindsay Stevens from Vail, Colorado. Hey, everybody. I'm Tony Macri from Copper Mountain, Colorado. Hey, I'm Amy Gann Bailey from Stratton, Vermont. Chris Rogers, also at Vail, Colorado. Awesome. And tonight we are diving into uh, the fundamental that talks about pivot and the, the fundamental really being control of the board's pivot through flexion, extension, and rotation of the body. Um, but before we dive into that, when we kicked off the, the first video, um, when we were really diving into tilt and how we manage tilt, um, we were so excited to dive into it that we really didn't just kind of kick off this whole series with what the, the fundamentals really are and, and then kind of dive into them. So we want to take a minute on this session to really just um, speak to what the snowboard tech fundamentals are and, and what they are, you know, steering to do and and, you know, I'll kick it off and then I'll just pass it around the room. But it's um, for me, you know, we've we've had this awesome history of teaching snowboarding where we've had, you know, fundamental movements and performance concepts. And and we've always talked about what the body does and what the snowboard can do. And we've talked about the cause and effect between them. And, and as pros and instructors and coaches, as we've uh, learned how to communicate that, we've just really developed a lot of cause and effect understanding. But as we developed the fundamentals, it was really to really hammer home that cause and effect for, for pros so that we had common language for things like movement analysis and delivering feedback and just tech understanding all together is so that we had some common language that we as instructors kind of understand. And then we can simplify and we can get out to our students. And so as we dive into that, I want to go around the room to let others add in as we really describe what the fundamentals are. And then tonight we're going to dive into uh, uh, the fundamental about pivot. Yeah, you know, uh, Donovan, you know, when you talk about the fundamentals, I think the key word, obviously fundamentals, you know, uh, understanding that this is something that's happening all the time. And anytime we're on a snowboard and we're, we're sliding down the hill, these things that we talk about is our six fundamentals. These are things that are apparent all the time from the very first time snowboarder all the way up to the pro and the expert and the people that we're seeing on TV right now in the Beijing Olympics, um, which is cool. It's cool that we can apply it to all levels of snowboarding and the you know, the whole, um, the whole gamut of, of alpine snowboarding to freestyle to backcountry and everything, which is cool. The other word that jumps into my mind is uh, relationship. We, we use the word cause and effect. That's been common language for us, but uh, just that, that partnership or relationship between what the body's doing and what the snowboard's doing in those six different realms sums it up. Yeah, I've been looking at the fundamentals and, um, you know, Donovan, you're talking about the cause effect relationship and it's really nice to be able to look at um, some of the pieces and see that connection of, you know, tonight we're talking about pivot and how it, how our board pivots from an effect of our flexion, extension and rotation movements. So being able to look at what's happening, where it's happening on the board and connecting it with what joint is making that movement happen. Something I think is great about these fundamentals is, you know, they, they intersect so much. They, they relate to each other. They're always present. You know, when we, when we teach, we, we're teaching people to outcomes or to their goals, and we can break these fundamentals into parts and really highlight them individually to build skills towards towards that outcome and then we blend them together for that outcome so it's it's a great way to have common language so you can break it into parts and push them back to the whole and uh what a great way to to, to get some consistent feedback too as, as donovan mentioned it's great for giving feedback 
imagine going to an exam or getting some feedback from a trainer and that feedback you can bring to another another trainer to to develop some skills instead of saying i'm working on this task i'm i'm working on this outcome which may be a few different approaches you can talk to i'm working on this particular fundamental or blending these fundamentals and that's going to be a common language it's going to help build skills and that's what really is about is building skills going back yeah. oh Okay. Going back to how Donovan kicked this off, um, talking about the fundamentals, uh, I relate a lot to the word truths as, as a kind of synonym for what we're talking about, truths about snowboarding. Um, and, and twist is a really easy one to, to kind of highlight that. We can be actively twisting the snowboard to create an outcome. We can twist the snowboard kind of as, as, a, as a result of other movements we're making. It, you'll see, um, watching the Olympics this week, you'll see the snowboard twist, not necessarily because they're trying to use twist to do something, but because it's an it's a result of the movements they're making, or you can control twist by making simultaneous movements that don't twist the snowboard. And regardless, the, the torsional twist of a snowboard is a truth. How we pivot a snowboard is a truth. And um, as I've discussed these over, over the last couple of years training, um, I, 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 I end up back on that word truth quite a bit, the, the overall truths of snowboarding, the fundamentals of snowboarding. Chris, that was a, a word that was right in my head too with I think of it is that it's their truths. They're not rules. So like as snowboarding grew, grows and as snowboarding changes, like these things are still going to be there and be present and be things that we can always look at, even if the style of what we want out of our snowboard changes. I think that's uh, pretty cool hearing you guys chat about it. Right. And I think about the truths, like you said, Chris, and I kind of have been viewing these fundamentals I was like, I don't have maybe big headphones on, but kind of like the DJ booth and there's six knobs and they're always there. Right. And sometimes I want to crank up the twist. Right. And sometimes I want to have the opposite. And I'm really going to focus on, uh, you know, inclination and lay out a big Euro carve. Right. And then other times I'm working all of them as I move down through the bumps. But, you know, kind of your points, Amy, it's it's you can your own style comes through, but these fundamentals never go away. They're always underlying. And some of us may choose to turn this knob over here. And some of us might choose to turn this one over here, but they're always going to be there. Now, I just wanted to play, um, go off something that Rolls was saying, because like for me, I'm working towards becoming an examiner and, you know, all the fundamentals coming out at first, it was like, oh, all this new information. But the more I dove into it, I realized it was all the same information I've been learning the entire snow sports career that I've had, but I appreciate them because it gave me like a specific language in order to provide constructive, like MA feedback. So that's helped me a lot this season in um, my development too. Yeah. And just some of the things I'm hearing is, um, you know, when I hear truths, you know, I've definitely talked with people about that idea and, and I've actually had pushback from people that are, you know, think of snowboarding as super core and they don't want to have truths or, you know, Amy really clarified it that it wasn't rules, but um, it kind of ties back into, you know, Rolls was kicking it off and he's saying, you know, when we talk about lessons and we don't have students come up to us and say, you know, can you teach me to control the board's pivot through flexion, extension, and rotation of the body? That's not something that a student comes up and asks for. They're asking for outcomes. They're asking for, hey, I can't stay on my feet when I'm trying to make turns on this, you know, blue trail, or I, I'm trying to put my board on edge and I, I can't get it to, to really hook up and do something for me. And as instructors, we use these, these fundamentals or these truths to build the skills that they need to be successful with those outcomes, right? And, and so it's, you know, it, when you think of it as, um, what do these really do for us? Steph's absolutely correct. They're building common language for us. They're building common information for us to then help people with skills to then go ride the mountain or stay on their feet or just have more fun to whatever it ends up being. And that's going to be filling in the blanks for the students. And so I think that that's just a big common theme for me as we make this transition is that these are knowledge nuggets and knowledge truths for us to help us do our jobs easier and more concise and then communicate amongst each other better. So all really cool stuff. So with I love knowledge nugget. I just, I wrote knowledge. that down. I will be repeating that this season. Uh, also like the, uh, with the fundamentals and talking about breaking them down and uh, strategies for MA stuff. And uh, it, it, I think of like pathways or opportunities 
these six fundamentals are a route to get those outcomes you're looking for. And this is uh, a way for us to talk about it or frame that up for somebody to be successful. Awesome. So we've laid the foundation and let's kick it off again. Tonight is the second video in a, a six part series where, you know, this team right here is just having very real conversations about these fundamentals. Tonight, we are talking about control the board's pivot through flexion, extension and rotation of the body. And, and we're going to talk about what that means from beginner lessons all the way up through stuff that we're working on in our own riding and stuff that we're figuring out in our own riding and figuring out for students. And so let's just kick it off. What are you guys, what are some things jumping out of your head about uh, control and pivot? Well, knowledge nugget. There are so <laughs> many ways to do that. <laughs> and it yeah. covers it in the language, the way it's described, right? What, what's so cool is it's got the, it's got the board performance and it's got the, previously known as fundamental movements. It's got the body movements. We've paired them together. So you have flexion, extension, and rotation of the body so that it's not restricting. There's so many options, so many options to get the board to pivot. A common thing I'll talk about is like rotation in the spine would be something that you could apply to get that board to pivot. Or you could move it a little bit lower and you could talk about what's going on to turn your pelvis uh, and what joints you'll have to apply in your legs to make that happen. And so like, there's just to your point roles, multiple ways to, to tackle uh, creating or, or getting that outcome of your board pivoting for you and, and whatever application you're going to apply that. And you, I think it allows the opportunity to cater that to whatever the needs are of the guests. Larson, uh, that's hitting something that uh, me that comes to my head. This, you know, last week I was um, working a level two exam, and I, I had somebody teaching, and I asked a couple follow up questions, and and I said, you know, what are we, what are you asking people to do to get that to happen? And they just said rotate, and I said, okay, you know, what are we asking them to rotate? And 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 then they said, um, well, kind of the the middle, and uh, and they kind of were real vague with it, and we were talking through some things, and and it turned into a loose conversation that I think is a, a much bigger conversation where I think sometimes instructors um, and especially different disciplines, ski and ride, when we talk about what we can rotate and what it does to our gear um, changes drastically based on what our experiences are. And, and really, you know, what I'm getting at is uh, I, I would challenge you to do a pool, go to your ski and ride school and ask people um, if they consider the hips part of the upper body or the lower body. Um, and I think you're going to get some wildly different answers. And, um, and for me, just like very unscientifically pulling people, I've typically seen that skiers think of the hips as part of the upper body and they think of turning the legs inside the hip socket, but then snowboards a lot of times consider the hips part of the lower body. And they talk about, uh, turning the hips and rotating the hips and doing different things like that. And so I think sometimes when we use these like really common words like rotation, it's super important to back step to make sure that people are talking about how, what, how hard, what, you know, exactly what the details are, because um, if they consider the hips part of the upper body and they're talking about turning the big core, that might have a way different outcome on how the board pivots than if they're talking about really, you know, using the hips underneath them for some separation and turning the hips as part of the lower body. And so just really cool. I would challenge you go pull some people and see what they consider the hips to be. And then it'll help you understand where they come from when they start to describe movements and the effects on gear. And Hey, Donovan, I think those are some, uh, some cool points, but I think maybe we can even just back up for a second, right. As we start thinking about rotational movements in the body, and maybe just kind of uh, hear what everybody has to say in terms of like, you know, uh, real versus ideal, right. Or we kind of think about like, what's this, image or what is it that we're shooting for when we uh try to um sorry i got some background noise going on right um when we try to turn our snowboards right and, and it's really kind of that kind of general statement or maybe i'll kick it off by saying you know usually the closer we can make those rotational movements to the snowboard right the faster it's going to be right the kind of more control we'll have with our snowboard but to your point it's not always what the what the guest needs um but just kind of thinking about maybe starting out like what's what are kind of some of the most efficient rotational moves we can use to, to make different types of turns. Right. And so I, I mean, I'll kind of kick it off there and kind of thinking about this. We use this language of 
um, you know, flex extension and rotation. And we think, well, how do we use both of those? And I think about, you know, maybe that steering movement that we would use in that classic skidded turn, right? Which would be a combination of, of rotating that femur right inside of the hip joint, which we would generally point as a lower body movement, but also pairing that with flexing that, um, you know, your front knee and ankle, right? As you steer the board into the turn, right? So I kind of think about like, okay, well, what's that picture? And I don't know, I'd love to hear everybody else's thoughts and kind of maybe what that ideal picture is of, of rotational movement. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Chuck, because I, I started thinking about, um, you know, we, we often pair the idea of pivot with rotation. We've said the word rotation a lot so far, and it's, it's great to start thinking about, <laughs> about, um, how our flexion extension movements also can help us pivot the board. So when you look at the rotation of the upper spine, eventually it's going to pivot the board. It is, as you said, pretty far away but it works. It makes something happen to the snowboard. But as we start to move down into maybe where the, the, the lower spine is connecting to our hip or where the femur is connecting to the hip, we can also use those rotary movements and start to stabilize that upper spine from rotation. Um, but to do that, you know, ideally we'd probably have to start blending in some of those flexion extension movements. And when we start looking back at our fundamental, we're looking at how flexion extension and rotation affect pivot on the snowboard. So I think it's great that you brought that, you know, that ideal versus, or not versus anything, but the, how ideally those movements will look. Um, there's some that are a little less efficient, but as we start blending those two movements, our two fundamental body movements together, we're going to get some more efficient movement, more efficient pivot out of our snowboard. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. And Chuck, you said something that that kind of resonated with me, and it actually brings up a little bit of a, a knowledge nugget. We'll, uh, we'll go with the knowledge nugget piece. Um, you know, you hear people talking about pivot, and then you also hear people talking about steering. And what is the difference between pivot and steering? And to me, pivot is when the board is is you know, pivoting around a certain access point and steering is where we start to blend in some other things like edging and pressure. And it's, it's working through an access point that's probably away from the snowboard. Um, so, so with that being said is, you know, when we look at this fundamental, we have the key word in there is control, control the board's pivot. And we, we think about timing, intensity, and duration to be able to do that, to talk about the movement patterns that, you know, Lindsay was just talking about with the rotation throughout the body. Um, so I think it, it's clear that when we're, when we're teaching and when we're doing movement analysis and when we're training for those higher level, um, maybe the level two, level three exams, that we, we clearly understand the difference between pivot and steering. And steering is a blend of possibly edging and pressure and, and pivot where pivot is truly just that pivot point. Um, so if we can kind of separate that out and, and think about the outcomes we get from both of those scenarios, um, I think would be cool. And, and as we start to blend in the time and intensity duration of those rotational and flexion extension movements, we get those different outcomes. Lindsay brought up the term effective and efficient as, as two different thoughts. And I, and I think those are really key words that we use, especially as we talk about, about beginner and intermediate snowboarders and, and things that might be efficient uh, and effective or things that might be more efficient, but less uh, effective or things that might be more effective and less efficient, right? Like um, in, in different places, going back to what Brian was, was talking about, different places uh, that we might control that pivot that might be more or less efficient or more or less effective. Um, in our intermediate snowboarders, we, we see a lot of upper lower body separation in the, in the mean of, uh, of counter rotation, which is a mass movement, turning the shoulders and the lower body in opposition to each other, which uses more energy. It's a less efficient maneuver, but can be very effective, right? If you're about to hit a tree, you're going to use everything you can to turn the snowboard, which might be counter rotation. But as a general rule, like turning down the hill, we're going to try to move that movement down towards the snowboard using uh, femur rotation within the hip socket, using um, you, using more efficient ways of snowboard because we don't want to just be uh, using upper and lower body in opposition to each other all the time as it's a rather inefficient um, maneuver. So I think Lindsay and Lindsay brought up a really good point there in terms of those terms and, and thinking about things not so much as good or bad, but in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. The other, the other term, speaking of terms, 
I really like how us as, as snowboarders, we use the pivot in relationship to the board and we use rotation in relationship to the body. And in, I know in other disciplines, it's, it's mixed around a little bit. It's not always defined like that. Um, but for, for a long time, we've talked about ro rotation related to the body, pivot related to the board. And I think another, another um, just to back it up even a little bit more, some people feel that pivot, and it's been said tonight, uh, pivots all related to rotation. I think, Lindsay, you said it. And when they think about flexion extension, they often don't think about that you can flex and extend in opposition to get the board to pivot in the center. And that's pretty important to get that centralized pivot when you have just flexion, when you have just extension, say of the back leg, I'm goofy foot, can you tell? Um, then it pivots around the front foot. And we see that a lot with students, you know, students that are looking to break through from novice to intermediate. We see that in intermediate students that are working towards more advanced terrain. Uh, they tend to just pivot around that front foot and flex and extend that back leg. And to get that centralized pivot, having that opposition flexion extension movement. And yes, there may be some rotation of the body uh, that goes along with that, but you can still get pure pivot from flexion and extension. And sometimes that's a big light bulb for people. They're like, oh yeah, pivot, rotation. Yep, those two are aligned. But it's flexion and extension that really uh, can make a difference. That's huge, Real Z. So this exact point came up. We we're doing a level three exam last week or two weeks ago now. Uh, and then it was in uh, another ride clinic we're doing really talking about controlling the board's pivot. Everybody is really sucked in and glued to the front leg movement, right? Really driving that knee, rotating that femur into the initiation of the turn, right? And you can get some real strong movements there, but, but oftentimes what happens, you know, with our instructor crowd, it's, you know, trying to make these uh, symmetrical turns, right? Keep that speed, keep that size pretty consistent is they kind of oversteer the, the first part of the turn and then they forget about the second half. And it becomes like you said, I'll do a goofy foot, right? That extension of the back foot, which is totally, you know, changing the board's pivot point and, and oftentimes making a very different shape uh, through the, the completion of the finish of the turn. So we had long conversations and I think it's, you know, kind of one thing I like to talk about when we talk about pivot is to make sure that you're using that rear leg and rotating that rear femur, especially through the control and finish of the turn to, to keep controlling that pivot. I guess we know the pivot point in the snowboard is not a, a static point. It's not one place in time. And in fact, as you look to go through that intermediate advanced or your level two, your level three, it's important that you not only understand the pivot point, but you can control it in kind of fore and aft, but also laterally edge to edge, right? We get back to this point. I think Tony was, was talking about in his little uh, knowledge nugget there about, um, you know, making sure that um, we, we address how that pivot point changes uh, throughout the turn. Um, so, yeah, like I think about, um, you know, that rear leg, uh, rear leg flex and extension rotation kind of create those steering movements, you know, in the second half of the turn. Chuck, I, yeah, I'm going to combine what you're saying with what Rolls was saying is I'm going to take a step back. It's if you go to the novice rider, right. And we talk about they're on their heel edge and they can uh, extend one leg and pull the other leg up underneath them. And the board starts to find the fall line and then they can pivot it back and they can extend the other leg. And it's that give and take. And, and we coach that so much where it has to be both legs working, right? Like you're saying, it can't be just one and it can't be just the other. It has to be both of them working to pull the board up underneath you, extend, and then kind of bring it back underneath. And that's something that we see so much when we're working with instructors and when we're working with kind of students in that novice kind of breaking into the immediate zone. And, uh, but one of the things I want to emphasize on is, you know, we get so fixated on fixing that sometimes that we don't look for that strength identification of if they have that really strong uh, like extension of the rear leg, how do we get them to understand where to use that? Like you're talking, Chuck, and how do we not just throw that away to try to say, no, 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 you have to use your front leg more, but how do we really, you know, identify what they're doing well and then show them where it applies and where they can use it so that they don't just throw that skill away. Cause even that, that we've all seen it, that person just windshield wipers down the mountain 
they have that skill and they're riding blue terrain, maybe even black terrain with that skill. And we don't need to totally just deconstruct it and reinvent them and say, no, 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 we need you to steer with the front leg. We want to say like, you have this really solid windshield wiper. Let's add stuff to it and let's use that that you already have and let's build off of it. And so I, I think that's so huge that you're kind of going to like the advanced side of what roles you was saying, and then also just making sure that we can back it off and, and make sure that people add to their bag of skill as opposed to always trying as instructors to kind of get them to do it one way or get them to do it like the ideal way. I love that you say it, like, you know, celebrate that windshield wiper turn because it helps so many people and it gets them to a point with their snowboarding. I've had tons of people that come to lessons that, you know, they're saying, this is my first lesson. I've never had a lesson before. I can get down the mountain. I can, I can turn on my heels and my toes, but I've just plateaued with my skills. And, you know, what you're saying, Donovan, is like, let's add to it. Let's not look at this as it's some sort of bad habit or something that we're doing wrong. It's something that's been going well, but we just need to add something more. And yeah, I really like that you brought up that point. A person with the windshield wiper turn can probably do a way better speed check in the park than someone who's only come through the lessons and only knows how to rotate their femur in their hip socket. We can always find uh, ways to make inefficient movements effective in another another uh, uh, environment. Rosie and I were talking about the other day and, and Rosie had a couple of great examples of, of places where bad snowboarding is actually a more effective movement for another, another type of riding. And I think that's a really good piece for us to keep in mind. Yeah, Chris, time and a place for everything. And I always use that as an example is that little jib kid who's in the rail line and they can pivot their board and dump speed without getting out of balance, without changing their line or trajectory. They're not messing with anything. They're not changing where they're balanced over the edges. They're not, they're literally just dumping speed, kicking it back in the fall line, hopping on the next feature. And that is a high end skill that a lot of people actually struggle to accomplish because we get people who are so used to putting it on edge and getting performance and getting snap and bend and, and steering. And so that time and a place for every skill and just knowing where to apply them, that's our job, right? Is to help people to show where to apply their skill. So super good point. Um, really cool. I think, I think something that, um, that, that, you know, you're talking about all those, all those like performance little moves and stuff like that to dump speed and things like that. But things that get overlooked sometimes is like, sometimes when we see, people riding and, and utilizing rotation through the body. Sometimes the, the rotation in their body is actually being utilized to shut down pivot as well uh, versus just creating it. Right. Um, you're seeing a lot of it right now, obviously um, when, when guys and girls are coming out of big spins at the Olympics and, and trying to shut that down uh, to set that landing and stuff like that. Um, so it's cool to see it as a preparatory move to a trick or like as a, a recovery move after a trick, um, as well as for turns as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I, there's so many crazy, um, connections to the rotary moves as far as like controlling the pivot. It's not just to create, but it's also to shut it down for sure. Don't need to add on to that, uh, knowledge nugget there. I was thinking about 50 fifties in the park and, and when you start, to add on or put some flair on that or, or have a sequence where there's a trick that's going to come later as you exit that rail, you see people managing that pivot in the outcome of no pivot, keeping that board in line on top of the feature, then they'll have to include some flexion of ankles and knees to allow them then to rotate that pelvis or in their spine somewhere so they can unwind that and then get like a clean 180 out. And so just to turn it all upside down, sometimes we see the outcome of the board pivoting, but there's also an application where we're trying to hold the board still and manage pivot in a different application. So you can do other things with your body for other outcomes. Yeah. And to, to that, add on to that Larson, like when you're doing butters and stuff, like all the freestyle stuff, how are you going to do that stuff without those, you know, flexion extension and rotation working together um, to get outside your feet and the nose roll or something like that? Like it, it has to be like all mixing together at all times, um, regardless of it being a windshield wiper turn or right in the middle, like 
all those things are happening a little bit at each point. Amy and, and Larson, one of my favorite games to play in, in clinics is just what you're describing is trying to actively manage the pivot with the outcome of no pivot, right? And think about doing, uh, love doing the tail press game, right? Or nose press game where it's see if you can keep your board tracking straight down the fall line, right? Holding a tail press or nose press, but, but keep it in a straight line and really eliminate that pivot from your, uh, uh, you know, from your trajectory. And it's really pretty hard to do. It's kind of fun, but it's, uh, it's a really good way to kind of highlight that, that point that you're getting there too, Larson. There's a, there's a trick that my brother made up years ago that we call the one, maybe <laughs> it's when you wind everything up and throw a one, but you don't let yourself actually spin. And, uh, it looks ridiculous. It's very fun. And it can be very painful if you really throw it hard enough. <laughs> I need to see this and I want to try it. I got to see this at women's summit a couple of years ago. Yes, it was really that. fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's been I a while. I haven't thrown one this year. What what did you call it? A, a, one, a one maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to tickle into uh the different ways that that pivot is related to multiple other fundamentals. We've talked about where that pivot point is along the length of the snowboard, which is related to how you're controlling pressure along the length of the snowboard or how uh, maybe you're locking a rotation to, to control pivot through using twist or um or through using flexion extension rotation of the body to not pivot the snowboard which might be through using some tilt to to set so i, I think you know that that knowledge nugget that that matt larson started getting into there was starting to 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 tickle how we control multiple fundamentals uh just while focusing on one so so whether it's creating pivot or uh or creating a lack of pivot that that often requires using another fundamental to back that up Um, you know, that's, that's funny. That conversation came up in a clinic I was leading the other day, just about how, you know, trying to eliminate something is still controlling that thing. Like trying to have less pivot is still controlling your pivot. Um, just because it's not there doesn't mean we're still managing that. And I think that's so important in the, you know, in our wording of our fundamentals, we talk about that control piece. Yeah, pre-fundamentals in, in Rocky Mountain are level two exam. You draw an intro to teach topic. So you'd get like uh, intro to boxes and then you draw a board performance and, and people would draw a tilt and they would freak out, right? Like, oh, how do I how do I teach a box with tilt? And it was that exact conversation. Well, you're going to reduce tilt. You're going to try to limit your tilt or you'd get carving, intro to carving and a, and a focus on pivot. And again, people would be like, oh no, how do I treat, teach carving? There's no pivot in carving. And, and I think that's one of the things that the new, the fundamentals really clarifies is it's controlling tilt, it's controlling pivot. Um, and and that, that, that lack of is still control, whether that's intentional or not, um, you know, it might be a lack of control uh, versus a lack of pivot, but um, uh, you're still working on reducing an aspect of, of the board performance or of the fundamental versus actively trying to create it. And I think, I think that really clarifies some of the ways that we teach things or talk about things and you know, trying to, it, it, if you look at common errors that people make on, a, on a, their first 50-50, they open up their shoulders, which introduces pivot, and they come off the box sideways and land on their heel side edge. Um, and that's an area where at a very, very beginner level and in an intro to a park lesson, you might be treat, teaching controlling pivot by staying aligned and trying to slide straight across the box. Yeah, I think that was a, that was a really important knowledge nugget that I learned a while ago that was... It's like knowing that, you know, I could let something not happen. And that still meant I was in control of that board performance by however I was, you know, using a flexion extension movement or a rotation movement. I'm going to try to pivot away from the knowledge nugget phrase and emphasize the fact that Roger just used tickled when he was talking about how we move on our snowboard. And, uh, but <laughs> Chris, you're, yeah, you're spot on and you're talking about control being the the key word and, and the verbs being flexion, extension, rotation. And, and we're trying to limit pivot or trying to limit tilt or twist or any of them. Um, we're still using the same flexion, extension, rotation, right. And we're still using the body and we're kind of like Tony was talking about shutting things down. And, and that's such a, uh, it's, it's, it's cool that it helps us ramp it up and it helps us shut it down using the same verbs. And then just talking about which joints of the body and how we're doing it, how hard we're doing it and things like that. Um, I don't know who it was. Somebody said something that made me 
try to think of something and I'm kind of thinking out loud with this one, but I, I started to think that like a cab spin off a jump is really just a high functioning windshield wiper turn where you're a little bit outside your feet and you're kind of combining that along the length pressure along the length, but really just a, a high functioning windshield wiper move to create that spin. And I would love to hear some people talk about that. Donovan, you said the word verb two times there and I, uh, you just slipped it in. And I think we need to emphasize that, especially when we're talking about all the fundamentals, each fundamental has some very carefully chosen verbs, whether it's manage or control or uh, whatever it is. And that really is the essence of each of these fundamentals is that relationship again of applying the body to get some kind of outcome or uh, I, I guess I have to use one of the verbs like control the board somehow, like control pivot. Cap spin. Controlling your cap spin. I love the whipping feel that you get when you're really spinning um, and and pivoting around like the, the, the new nose, the tail of the board. And the board just starts to whip around. I think about um, that windshield wiper turn with no, a no slide too. I'm like those folks that are windshield wipering, they're going to crush it with the nose slide on the box. Or a back lip. Is, um, oh so yeah, just, have... just back lip, Amy. No big deal. Just do that. Yeah, so just do that. Like you always do. Just do that. Yeah. Cue, so, the, cue the shot of Amy doing a sick back lip right if now. If it existed, that would be sweet. <laughs> Go by it here, I'm sure. You know it does. We're going to shoot that next next uh, photo shoot. We got I'm it. Stoked. Yeah. Well, I'll see you in a couple of weeks, so we'll get the shot then. We got that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> easy. We'll get Brian, that in there. when you think about cab spins and stuff like that, you know, you start thinking about like leverage points and, and creating rotation to create leverage on either an end of your board, or it could even be further from that, you know? Um, and I think when you talk about large versus small levers, you talk about the power that you're getting and you're setting up for that. And, you know, we talk a lot about kind of setting that rotation and, and how we set it to then manage it. And, uh, and yeah, like that's a great example of using that, using that leverage to, uh, to get that, that, that spin and it, it to your point, it's a great feeling when you get it right. But when you get it wrong, then you're then you're on the other side and you're back down to where Larson was talking about trying to control so you don't over overspin. <laughs> Thank your example of the, the cab spin, which is one of my favorites. I love that that feeling you get when you hit the sweet spot on your board and you feel it flex and snap and toss you into the air. Um, it's uh it's kind of a really cool way to focus on the TID as well, because you've really got to have that pretty dialed to find that, that sweet spot and kind of pairing that with, uh, you know, controlling the, the pivot point is what makes that, that spin so sweet. Cause you all tried it before where you kind of get nothing from your snowboard. Right. And it's usually like the, uh, the timing's a little off or the intensity is not quite there, or you maybe didn't hold it quite long enough to get that flex of your board. And it's real interesting to me, interesting to me how that kind of, ties right into it but it's also it's, you know you're you're controlling that pivot point but you're also controlling the future pivot point right at the moment of takeoff and you can kind of lap that over with the whole atml approach to things and making sure that you're setting up so when you you take off your pivot point is there for a second in time but then it's moving almost immediately once you uh, are up into the air doing your your trick your maneuver so when you put that board back down in the snow that pivot point is going to be in a place where you can stay on your feet. It's kind of yeah. a lot of happening all at, all at the same time. Yeah. You got me thinking about tail butters, like the difference between if you use your femur to create your rotation, to bring the board around spin, spinning on the tail and how that rotation for me, at least tends to be like, or that pivot tends to be a lot slower. So, you know, what I, what I could do in the time of a 360, if I tried to use more of my upper spine to create that rotation or create, sorry, create this pivot, I could do a 720 in that same amount of time, just because of the difference in intensity of, you know, what those joints can do. 
Yeah, I think, you know, something that's really cool if you start thinking about the pivot point moving through a trick, for example, like if you were to do like generally a, like a cab one, like a half cab, the pivot point's going to pretty much stay in the same spot. But like when you take that to a cab three, a cab five, you might start with that leverage point out around the nose or the switch the switch knows, right? And then all of a sudden in your air, you're gonna scissor your legs to get that second half of that trick. All of a sudden the pivot point moves to the center of the board. That's really cool, a cool way of thinking about how to control um, uh, that pivot point and change that pivot point through the trick to, to get that extra little bit of rotation. And, and you know, it's cool watching in the Olympics last night, like, you know, some of the guys getting that, like a crazy 18 that we saw, like that was insane. Um, how he was able to get that last little scissoring of the legs to set that thing down was, was unbelievable. Well, on that, on that same thought, like watching the different ways that people took off on, on the takeoffs, like you got Stale Sambek throwing flat spins, taking off both feet and, and, you know, doing 12s and 14s as a flat spin, uh, really just, just creating that rotation along uh, one axis versus uh, there was one of Mark McMorris's takeoffs where it was like the, Tail, the very tip of his nose, I think, that was still on the snow as he was also controlling pressure along the length of the snowboard to create a, an off axis rotation around a different pivot point. And so just the different, the different ways based on, uh, on rotation, um, how, how pivot, and we've, we've talked for years about changing pivot points. Uh, and, and this, the Olympic Games was a great place to watch that, how, how that affects rotation, whether it's a, a triple cork or a flat spin and how, how they're controlling that pivot through the different body movements to generate that at takeoff. Chris, yeah. it's, it's funny you're thinking the access there. I was definitely watching people, particularly as they got corks, trying to track. I definitely was dorking out on the, one of the two of the slow most trying to track. Like, it's like, man, where did that pivot point just go when they start getting upside down, right? And trying to whip around the double corks and the triple corks. And it's, it's real it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's a good test for your brain to try to track it and see if you can follow the the pivot point kind of in two planes, even though their move, their body is moving in three planes and how it looks like, or, you know, and you guys can all see it, right. It sounds really complicated, but you can tell right when somebody's kind of floating through the air, if they're going to land nose heavy or tail heavy or by their toe side edge or by the heel side edge. And it's all really closely related to the pivot point. Kind of like Tony was saying, like that was sort of set when they took off and if they don't control that pivot point, like into the future to set up for the landing, then, then things are going to go upside down in the, in the wrong, at the wrong time. Sorry, Donovan, you were going to say. No, something. I Chuck, it's you're exactly where my head is, is it kind of goes to what Tony was saying. What Chris was saying is that that little moment in time where you're leaving the lip, it can be a, you know, a full cab going just 360. And we've all felt it where you, come off the nose. And if you aren't kind of projecting your body forward in the right position to kind of get balanced in the air and you get all extended, you end up in this real like wonky, like cork, you know, cab spin because that moment in time, you weren't just like set up to get forward with your body. And it kind of goes back to what a couple of people have been saying about all the fundamentals are going on. You're, you're moving across the board. You're moving along the length of the board. You're, you're moving vertically as you're coming up and and it all still has to happen while your body's traveling towards the landing. And I agree when you watch like the super high end, you know, when people are throwing, you know, triples, um, even though their head and their shoulders might be below their feet at times, their, their whole body, their center mass is still kind of like moving from lip to landing. And you can start to see as stuff's going to snap underneath it and how it's going to move together and how they're still kind of, you know, again, just projecting themselves towards the landing. And it at the low end, you know, just going from, cab you know, half cab like tony said or full cab to like triple core the body still needs to be moving to get back above the gear and to then be landed bolts or or trying to be as close to it as possible and so it's such a blend but it relies on that moment in time where how balanced are you and what are you doing as you leave the, the snow to kind of set you up for that such really cool to see the, the level of tricks now and how people are able to, to calculate exactly how much energy and force they got to put in to get above the board when they come down. So crazy. So, hey, can I throw one last kind of thought in here? Maybe is uh, we talked to pivot. We haven't really hit on this much, but I, I noticed this in the pivot world, just this kind of past weekend riding with my, with my kids, my daughter's eight, my son's 11. Uh, and so my daughter is still riding a, um, a Burton board, right. With a beveled base, right. It's a little one ten. Right. And it's um, it was real interesting to me to kind of watch like what effect the equipment has on uh, 
particularly your ability to pivot the snowboard, right? And it's it's it was cool to kind of watch my daughter the last couple of years, sort of the 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 pivot was it's forgiving, right? With our LTR boards and kind of that setup that you've got, you know, you know Burton makes it easy to uh, help hook up those turns on that low end level, but to watch her sort of gain that awareness of where the pivot point, um, where the pivot point is and her ability to control it. And now she rides so much more confidently uh, because she understands that. And, you know, that's a, a like real props to the equipment there and helping her find that. Whereas I think with some other equipment, it might be different. So I'm just kind of curious everybody's take, like, I you know we all have different setups. Some of us are on uh, rocker camber blends. Some of us are on full camber. Some of us have dabbled on some, um, you know, some rocker boards and it, it changes. So maybe just a couple of thoughts on that from everybody. Um, uh, before I just we, before we wrap up. About Chuck, you, um, just something that happened yesterday. I had a student come up to a lesson and a board that was just a little like too big for her. And so she was really struggling to pivot the board. She was able to, but it took her a lot longer than it would have if she had downsized she was on like a, a 149 and I think a 144 so it would have been more appropriate for her um and yeah just equipment wise I just started thinking about that because it's super relevant to something I saw yesterday with a stu uh, student Chuck I'll jump on it I was working with a guy on Sunday who was on like a super stiff uh kind of what Lindsay's talking about a little bit longer board and we were just working on being real loose and I was seeing exactly where he was, where his weight was when he was trying to do some pivot moves because he was getting a ton of snow kicking up on certain parts of the board. Like as his edge was just engaging more, you know, full camber, super stiff board. And he just wasn't uh, smooth enough with some of the pivot moves he was trying to accomplish. And I was seeing those moments where like in my head, I'm like, oh man, he's about to catch an edge. And those little moments in time where it's really just trying to get him to bounce, but he was really just getting edge bite. And then he was starting to get that like preemptive snow, like, building up and kicking up over the board. And I would think that, you know, he was actually a perfect candidate for somebody who may have maybe early rise or even just, you know, a triple base or something would have made that slide a little bit more for him to feel a sensation. And, but he was getting like the very fine line between catching an edge and just getting snow, like ripping up over the edge. And, and I saw it and it was definitely driven by his, uh, you know, movement patterns and skill, but amplified by the gear he was on. It's a, it's kind of a blessing and a curse to be able to see that sort of stuff. Like we can, we can watch yeah, some like, of these movements. Uh, and, yeah, exactly. That cringe moment that you can, it makes me cringe before they, they even do fall sometimes. <laughs> or when they have the, like a lot of structure going tip to tail and you just hear it. You're like, yeah. no. Yeah. Bevel is a beautiful thing for for new, new snowboarders. Uh, my daughter has this similar setup, Chuck, where uh, it's so forgiving. She's five and she can just whirly bird and be like, I'm doing it, dad, check it out. There's I'm a getting. viral video right now of a little girl. She's gotta be like two, like just standing. Exactly, same, same kind of thing. She's just sliding backwards and everybody thinks it's the coolest thing and I'm making that cringe face yeah. watching the whole time. <laughs> I saw that. It's, it's, it. yeah. it's pretty wild, right? To watch, to watch people figure it out, right? Cause uh, so my son rode, you know, the kind of uh, base beveled LTR set up for a long time. And then he switched over to a little kid's never summer board uh, and watching him change his movements to find the new pivot point, right? Cause he went from, you know, a, <laughs> like three degree base bevel onto now having, you know, rocker camber or Rock, camber rocker camber right and finding the zones underneath his feet and you could see like when he when his pivot point was between the feet right he could really utilize that that reverse rocker that reverse camber section of it and was able to you know twist the board and get that board to have a pretty you know round turn but when he didn't and he you could see he could make those movements that he would have gotten away with on that ltr board um you know it's still pivot the board man he would he would find that edge and he would you would mm -hmm. learn real quick that, ooh, this is not the movement pattern I need to use with this snowboard. And I feel like we see that. I see that sometimes, you know, with our students as well. It's just like, 
yeah, like you're saying, Rolsey, on some of those beginner boards that are, um, you know, flat or have base bevels or whatnot, that man, they can get them to spin really easy. But then they have trouble when they start adding speed into the equation to stop that that uh, that pivot. Right? They get too much rotation from their body, and that board just wants to pivot and spin forever, like you're saying your five year old does. And it, it's interesting to kind of find the balance of like, okay, well, what equipment is going to work for, for what riding style or body type to find that balance? I find a super similar, similar thing when I go from, I ride camber all the time. And if I jump on a like flying V or a never summer, I have to like make a couple extra moves to stop my rotation. Like I have to like actively do something at the end of the turn to, to make it stop. That's uh, that's funny. I mean, I'm definitely like, uh, riding never so much for, for so much. I jump on a full camper board and I'm like, whoa, whoa, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta work a little harder here to make yeah. this, uh, to make this movement happen. Right. We have to flatten it out. I mean, that's something we didn't mention. It'd be worth just throwing in there is that, you know, when the board is flat, that's when it pivots the easiest. You know, a lot of people are on that, that are on a high edge. They're not really making that board pivot as much and getting that board to flatten out makes it pivot so much easier which is such an advantage when you when you do have some rocker in the middle like when the when the board has some rocker whether it's a hybrid spins more like a top and it pivots pretty quick when it's flat even when it's on edge a little bit you know you can steer it and and make it pivot but that camber board when you have that locked in decambered you know it doesn't pivot as easy so getting, getting students to get more over the board and this again, back to, it's hard to not talk about the other fundamentals. I mean, back to one yeah, of the original right points. In. Yeah. They just overlap so much, but when you're, you know, um, right over top of the board, making that board pivots way easier than when it's on edge. And then that art of that high end rider is that ability to feather that edge and, and the timing of when it, when you pivot the board in relation to how high the edge angle is, is, uh, you know, some really cool finite skills on, and how you can do that and steer, uh, steer the board around throughout the turn with a certain amount of edge angle. I just, I, I want to make like a quick PSA, you know, to everybody listening in tonight. This is one of those instructor moments where we're talking high end, what we have observed and learned throughout the years of what gear can help you know, a student do, right. Or help us, us do. But whenever you're, you know, projecting this out to your students, make sure you're not using judgmental language to talk about their gear and what it can and can't do, you know, cause it's, uh, I, we hold so much power sometimes with our students cause they look to us as the, the experts. And the minute we start to talk about like, Oh, your board doesn't do this as well because of, you know, it's set up like this, it can be so like deflating to those students. And instead, again, it kind of goes back to that strength identification where find what their gear does well, find what their moves do well, emphasize those and, and really just be careful with, you know, using judgmental language about whatever gear they're bringing. And and, because it can just be that make or break moment uh, for them. If, if, especially if they're on gear that they think is rad and then, you know, all of a sudden you get, they get deflated by us being like, Oh man, your gear's fighting you here. It's just kind of a quick call out. And I think we all know it, but it's important to remember to, that we hold a lot of power sometimes with the words we say and our students can really, it can make or break their day. And, and it's just, uh, just a, good to be aware of. Is your little yeah, knowledge be- nugget there, Brian, not to blame the equipment? Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know how to, a PC way to say that, but it's, it's us. It's not the equipment, right? Well, it's, well how we, about, I was going to say that yeah. can be really unmotivating, you know, and for a student when they're trying to work on a skill and you say like, Oh, your, your board doesn't do this. Well, it's like, well, why try and work on that skill? If, you know, if it's my snowboard's fault, right? Yeah. Um, or how about, how about it's, it's your job to adapt to what gear they have. Just because you can do it a certain way, look at what gear they have. And it's your job as the instructor to adapt. If you are if you don't have to, uh, if it's really easy to pivot the board with your type of board and theirs is not as easy, make those movements deliberate to give those visuals for them. You know, tailor your, use your skill to, to match the movements they have to do with their board. It's not their, their, to Donovan's point, it's not, not their fault. 
and and there's so much individuality in snowboarding and we all love it for that you know people people swear by their setups and everyone has different setups you know and it's up to us to work with our students and adapt our teaching and create learning so they can learn with their equipment too so so I was going to say with the board thing, um, you were talking about what helps people pivot easier and what doesn't, but I kind of look at it as a trade-off in a way. If you have a beginner student that rolls up with a more full cambered board, they're going to be on point. Like they have to learn correctly and they're going to be killing it when it gets up to dynamic turns. And the people who can turn easily on their board, that's great. Like they're going to have that learning curve, but they're going to have to relearn again once they up their equipment too. So it's kind of a trade-off. There's no bad equipment, you know? Yeah. I love that, Stephanie. Yeah. Like the, the full camber boards can be able to traverse across the hill where like anyone that's taught on someone on LTR, like it's great for those, that first couple hours, but as soon as you start trying to teach them how to traverse and they just side slip down the hill still, you're like, okay, we got to work on getting up on edge. Yeah. I think uh, that the last case study for that would be, um, was it, it was Zeb Powell, right? Didn't he have like a 185 or something at the knuckle huck in the X games? And I'm pretty sure he was pivoting that thing better than all the rest of us ever could. <laughs> <laughs> something that I think is kind of cool regarding pivot is, and we talked about this going back to the beginning of this call. When we talk about on snow movements, it tends to be the movements closest to the snowboard that, that most efficiently control pivot. So whether it's flex and extension through ankle and, and knee joints, whether it's rotation of a femur within a hip socket, but that ability to use movements close to the snowboard, very efficiently control pivot when it's attached to the snow or when it's touching the snow. And then as our conversation about the Olympics talked about, um, as we start looking at getting into the air, the rotation through the spine, rotating the shoulders becomes a more efficient way to create spin in the air where you, you can't, it's pretty tough to get further than like 180, uh, just through using lower body separation underneath the upper body. Like if you're trying to do a 180, that that's a, to Amy's point, the, 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 the one, maybe like you can get the board to go underneath the upper body to a point, but like most of us probably have maximum separation around 45 degrees. So you gotta, you gotta, at some point get the shoulders involved. But then as soon as we talk about snow, using those shoulders become less efficient. That's kind of cool. Like, like reversal in, in our world where if the snow is touching the snow, use those movements close to the snow to, to create efficient and effective movements. And as soon as you want to spin using that spine rotation and, and, the, and getting the shoulders involved and the head involved um, gets you into that bigger rotation zone. Yeah, I just got to give a shout out to the stance too, because there's a component of how your feet are locked to this board. That's going to hinder or accent or, have some kind of effect on how you're able to move over your board to get pivot. So I think that's just another piece, especially going back to that beginner lesson to set them up for success, look at their equipment and then have uh, a knowledge base of what to do with their stance so they can be as effective as possible with the equipment they have. Matt, are you talking about this versus this? You've been doing a lot of this lately. Have I? A lot of, a lot of both feet pointed towards the nose of the snowboard. And that's what I do. I should show it. Uh, okay. So I've been laughing at myself. There's these pictures and in, in like every one I'm like, like this, and this looks intense for snowboard and my lips are doing this when I'm in the pictures. And it, it's just like, it's just can't help it. Not the beginner stance, probably, probably something more like this. I think on that note, um, we have really started to beat pivot to death a little bit. And I think, uh, um, you know, like really just bring it to a close, we could talk about these fundamentals for hours or days. And, and that's really what these, these conversations are trying to get going is, is you, you know, you guys tune in, listen to us, just have really real conversations about these in our own riding with working with students, working on stuff that we're working on. Um, and we're going to keep this series going. If you haven't checked out the first video that we released on, on Tilt, um, we'll link it in this video so you can check that one out. And then definitely stay tuned. Uh, there's four more videos coming um, as we really dive into the rest of the fundamentals. And then we're, we're, we're playing with the idea of potentially doing like a Q&A video to, to a live one, you know, with a live studio audience of you guys to, to keep these conversations going. And so um, we're psyched that 
Um, people are, are seem to be pretty uh, interested in hearing some of this content, but really the goal of this is not to end at the minute where this video wraps, but take this and go and play with it in your own riding and, and try to see if you can feel some of the stuff we're talking about. See if you can um, build on it. See if you can um, develop some of your own concepts that you maybe challenge some of the stuff you're hearing here or, or affirm or, you know, like really get you to, to understand some of the stuff we're talking through. And, and so that's really what this series is, is just an opportunity for us to chat through these concepts, um, really work, like break them apart, build them back up, and then challenge you guys to go out and do the exact same thing and, and kind of nerd out and, and dork out like Chuck was saying. And so, uh, you know, thank you for tuning in. Um, Rider Rally, who wants to hit Rider Rally? This guy. Yeah. So that's the, the plug. Um, if you haven't checked out Rider Rally, uh, make sure jump on uh, the snowpros.org, check out the details, get signed up. It's building up to be a rad event this spring, uh, Big Sky, Montana. Um, this whole team is trying to make it happen so that we're all going to be there and we want to see as many of you as we can. So um, check out Rider Rally, check out the next four videos coming up. And if you haven't seen the first video we did, by all means, click on that one and, and get into that. So thank you for being here tonight. Donovan, right here is where you're going to edit in Ross Geller controlling the relationship between the couch and the stairway to control pivot. 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 pivot.